Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Do you know the old story about the priest that goes up to the microphone and bangs on it and taps on it and says, I think there's something wrong with this thing, and the congregation says, and also with you. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, that's a very gracious introduction, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, raise your hands if you've never been here before. Oh, so quite a few. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's an amazing place, um, and you saw a little uh, video clip of it. But uh, it's a great place uh, for the Archdiocese to have um, for all those wonderful cultural offerings, and I'm really happy to be here. We have, um, uh, at America Media, where I work, uh, a.k.a. America Magazine, we have um, used this place several times, and uh, we're always just delighted to be here. So I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be here with you. I'm going to take off my watch so I don't go over time. Uh, my talk is about four hours, <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to go over that. All right, so what I'd like to do tonight, uh, very briefly, is... Um, talk to you a little bit about uh, this book, um, how it came to be, uh, and then um, read from it. Um, so the seven last words. Um, raise, your hands, uh, the, raise your hands if you have ever heard of the seven last words, not the book. Okay. Raise your hands if you've never heard of the seven last words. Okay, so a few people. So it does bear um, a little explanation. The seven last words uh, are the seven last phrases or sayings. Uh, that Jesus uttered on the cross, at least as recorded in the Gospels. That's very important to remember, that you know, there may be others uh, that we don't know about. And interestingly, um, well, I'll read them to you. Um, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Woman, here is your son, said to Mary and uh, the beloved disciple. Son, here is your mother. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I am thirsty, and it is finished. Now, what a lot of people may not know uh, is that these uh, sayings do not appear in all of the Gospels. You would think it's kind of ironic. You would think that something so important and powerful would be cemented in people's memories and appear in all the Gospels. But uh, Jesus speaks uh, one time from the cross in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, three times in Luke, and three times in John, and they don't all sort of match up. So, for example, uh, woman, here is your son. I am thirsty, and it is finished. Appear only in John, right? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, which is, you know, a very famous saying, appears only in Luke. And one of the things to remember uh, is that the Gospels were prepared um, or edited um, by four different men, and they weren't, you know, taking notes at the crucifixion. I mean, that's not meant to be funny, but that they, there weren't people sort of recording things. So there's three stages of the Gospels uh, in terms of their um, creation, uh, which is one, Jesus' public ministry. So, you know, he, he uh, preached, he healed, uh, life, death, resurrection. That's, that's really stage one. Stage two is uh, oral histories. So you'll remember that um, many people believe that Jesus would return, remember, uh, before uh, they died, before the first group of uh, disciples died. When it became clear that that wasn't happening, um, the, the, the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, decided that it was time to write these, these things down. And they were writing for different communities and at different times. So Matthew is A.D. 65, very close to you know, the time of uh, Jesus' ministry on earth. The latest one is John, around A.D. 100. And they're writing for different communities, so they have different stories that they think are important. They have different stories that they want to stress. They have different themes they want to stress. And I was thinking about it on the way over that, um, you know, it's like if you asked uh, four people to describe you, right? Or you asked four people to describe your mother, right? They might forget some things. You know, I was thinking they might forget, well, you know, when, when was your mother, uh, when did she graduate from college? You think that's a very important date. People might get it wrong, right? So four different ways means uh, four different traditions of the seven last words. So the seven last words are more or less codified now. Uh, and around those seven last words uh, are created frequently liturgical services. I think from as early as the 16th century, there were liturgical services. And they usually combine the seven last words themselves, that is readings um, from the scriptures, um, music, usually. This is often on Good Friday. 
and then uh, meditations or prayers. Now, in many parishes, uh, Catholic parishes, this is done by seven different people. And it's often an opportunity to have interfaith, uh, excuse me, ecumenical, different Christian denominations, reflecting on the seven last words. So you might have, for example, an Episcopal priest, man or woman, a Baptist minister, and uh, you might have a, a, a lay person do one thing. So it's, it's usually very broad, uh, and you get different perspectives. So last year, uh, 2015, um, uh, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, who I hope we all know is the Archbishop of New York, uh, asked me to do the seven last words at St. Pat's. And uh, interestingly, I wrote back to, I think it was his secretary, and I said, uh, which ones do you want me to do? And he said, all of them. I said, wow. And I told a Jesuit friend of mine, and he said, all of them? <laughs> he was like horrified that people would have to listen to me on seven different occasions, you know, <laughs> over the course of three hours. But um, I found that it enabled me to uh, sort of use a theme and kind of put them under an under overarching theme. Uh, so the theme basically for the seven last words, uh, and, and it's a theme that is very important to me in my own spiritual life, is, it's on the back of the book, uh, Jesus understands you. And for me, the seven last words are, are a privileged access into uh, what Jesus experienced. Now, Jesus, we know, is uh, Catholics. If there's Catholics here, I'm sure there are a lot of Catholics here. Are, Jesus, we know, is fully human and fully divine. That's the classic uh, definition of, of who Jesus is. He's fully God and fully man. The seven last words, I think, show us glimpses of both. Glimpses of both his humanity and his divinity, but I think especially his humanity. Uh, they show that he suffered physically, he suffered emotionally, and even, I'm going to read uh, one of the chapters, uh, he suffered spiritually, which is a strange thing to think about when we think about Jesus. So what I'd like to do is read um, two chapters. One is will take two hours, the other will take another two hours. <laughs> they're, very, they're pretty short, actually. I'll read two chapters, they're very short. And then um, we'll take questions, which I much prefer to hearing myself uh, to, to hearing myself speak. So what I'll do is I'll read the passage uh, that it's based on, and then I'll read the chapter. So the first chapter that I'd like to read from is called uh, Jesus... Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. I'm sorry. <laughs> You'd think I'd know my own book by now. Where is it? Hold on. Hold on. It's coming. G uh, chapter 4. Jesus understands feelings of abandonment. And the, one, the last, the, the word is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is a reading from the Gospel of Mark. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave, gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. What are we to make of these extraordinary words? For some Christians, they are almost unbearable. Can it be true that Jesus thought that God the Father had forsaken him? Is it possible that Jesus doubted the love of the one he called Abba, which is an Aramaic word that's loosely translated as dad, did Jesus give up hope when he was crucified? Did he despair when he was on the cross? There are two main ways of understanding these mysterious words of Jesus, which he quotes from Psalm 22, and which would have been recognizable to any Jewish person at the time who had received religious training. The first possibility is that Jesus' words are not an expression of abandonment, but paradoxically, an expression of hope in God. Although Psalm 22 begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
and expresses the frustration of someone who feels abandoned by God. The second part of the psalm is a hymn of thanksgiving to God, who has heard the psalmist's prayer. This is a quote. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. In this interpretation, Jesus is invoking the psalm in its totality as the prayer of one who cried out to God and was heard. An example based on a more well-known psalm might be someone who says, and I'm sure you've heard this in your life, the Lord is my shepherd, and trusts that hearers would be familiar with the rest of the text of Psalm 23, even though I walk through the darkest valley, etc., and its overall message. In other words, saying the Lord is my shepherd is usually not taken just as an affirmation of God as shepherd, right? But as a shorthand for the entire psalm. This is a frequent explanation of Jesus' terrible cry from the cross. In short, Jesus was using that line from Psalm 22 to express his confidence in God. But there is another possibility. Jesus really did feel abandoned. This is not to say that Jesus despaired. I don't believe that someone who had such an intimate relationship with the Father, with Abba, could have lost all belief in the presence of the Father in this dark moment. But it is not unreasonable to imagine Jesus in this grave hour feeling as if the Father were absent. And remember, if he's crying out to God the Father, he's still in relationship with God the Father. Here we need to distinguish between a person believing that God is absent and feeling it. The latter is very common in the spiritual life. You may have had this experience yourself, believing in God, right, but not feeling God is close. Basically, you ask, where are you, God? Here is another important intersection between Jesus' life and our own. Of all people, Jesus could be forgiven for feeling abandoned. Think of what he has gone through by this point in the Passion. First, he's witnessed his betrayal by Judas, one of his closest friends, who had identified him to the authorities in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. Today, we tend to think of Judas as always evil, purely evil. But remember that Jesus had selected him as one of the 12 apostles. And so for a time, Jesus must have been close to Judas. Judas was a friend who had betrayed him. Also, the Gospel of Mark says that by this point, all but one of the apostles have fled, whether out of terror, confusion, or shame. So Jesus almost certainly feels abandoned and experiences, perhaps not for the first time in his life, human loneliness. Jesus has also been subjected to an exhausting series of late-night inquests, brutalized by Roman guards and marched through the streets of Jerusalem under a crushing weight. He is now nailed to the wood and suffering excruciating pain. So he could be forgiven for feeling abandoned. The one who abandoned himself to the Father's will in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before, who had given himself entirely to what the Father had in store for him, now wanders on the cross where are you? These feelings were probably intensified by his having been abandoned by his followers. Until this point, if you think about it, if Jesus felt lonely or misunderstood by the disciples, he might have turned to the Father for comfort, right? Now he goes there and feels alone. It may be the loneliest any human being has ever felt. Let's now turn to some biblical scholarship. One of the great 20th century New Testament scholars, Raymond E. Brown, a Sulpician priest, is the author of probably the definitive study of the Passion narratives called The Death of the Messiah. It's about a thousand pages long. It's, it's fantastic. At least, I think it's fantastic. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said, what do you think about Raymond Brown's The Death of the Messiah? And I said, I think it's rather thin, you know? <laughs> it's amazing. So... In an essay in that book entitled, Jesus' Death Cry, so just on this phrase, Father Brown says that in his view, abandonment was in fact what Jesus was experiencing. This is one of the great New Testament scholars. This is really interesting. Some Christians, say, says Father Brown, might want to reject that literal interpretation that would imply feelings of abandonment. Quote, they could not attribute to Jesus such anguish in the face of death, end quote. Yet as Brown says, if we accept that Jesus in the garden could still call the Father Abba, right? We accept that. 
then we should accept this, quote, screamed protest against abandonment, wrenched from an utterly forlorn Jesus who is now so isolated and so estranged that he no longer uses father language but speaks as the humblest servant, end quote. Now, what does that mean? Well, when Jesus speaks to the Father in the garden, notice he says, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Abba, as I've said, is a familiar way of speaking something like Dad. And by the way, both times I've visited the Holy Land uh, in, on pilgrimage, I have seen in Jerusalem on crowded streets, both times, it's really kind of cool, young children running to catch up with their father shouting, Abba, Abba. It's really quite striking. But on the cross, when Jesus says, my God, my God, he uses the Aramaic word Eloi, or the Hebrew Eli, depending on the gospel. That's a more formal way of speaking to God, isn't it? The shift from the familiar Abba in the garden to the more formal Eloi on the cross is heartbreaking. Jesus' feeling of distance then reveals itself not only in the scream and not only in the line of that psalm he utters, but also in the word Eloi. How could Jesus feel abandoned? How could someone who had enjoyed an intimate relationship with the Father express such an emotion? To answer that, it may help to consider a similar situation closer to our own time. In her early years, as you may know, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, soon to be St. Teresa of Calcutta, but I think everyone's going to call her St. Mother Teresa anyway, <laughs> the foundress of the Missionaries of Charity, enjoyed several mystical experiences of intense closeness with God. She also experienced that rarest of spiritual graces called a locution. She actually heard God's voice, at Jesus' voice, actually. And then, nothing. For the last 50 or so years of her life, until her death, she felt a sense of great emptiness in her prayer. At one point, she wrote to her confessor, quote, this is Mother Teresa, in my soul, I feel just that terrible pain of loss, of God not wanting me, of God not being God, of God not really existing, end quote. When her journals and letters were published not long after her death, some readers were shocked by these sentiments, finding it difficult to understand how she could continue as a believer and indeed flourish as a religious leader. But Mother Teresa was expressing some very human feelings of abandonment and speaking of what spiritual writers call the dark night, a state that, of being that moves close to but does not accept despair. In time, Mother Teresa's questions about God's existence faded, and she began to see this searing experience as an invitation to unite herself more closely with Jesus and his abandonment on the cross, which we were just talking about, and the poor, who also feel abandoned. Mother Teresa's letters do not mean that she had abandoned God or that God had abandoned her. In fact, in continuing with her ministry to the poor, she made a radical act of fidelity based on a relationship she still believed in, even if she could not sense God's presence. She trusted that earlier experience. In other words, she had faith. Jesus, as I see it, does not despair. He is still in relationship with Abba, calling on him from the cross. In the midst of horrific physical pain, abandoned by all but a few of his friends and facing his imminent death, when it would be almost impossible for anyone to think lucidly, he might have felt abandoned. To me, this makes more sense than the proposition that the psalm he quoted was meant to refer to God's salvation. So Jesus understands not only our bodily suffering, but also our spiritual suffering in these feelings of abandonment. He was indeed like us in all things except sin, and he experienced all that we do. So when you struggle in the spiritual life, when you wonder where God is, when you pray in doubt and darkness, and even when you are close to despair, you are praying to someone who is fully human and fully divine to someone who understands you fully. And chapter 5, Jesus understands physical pain. And the word is, it sounds like password, isn't it terrible? Um, the word is, I am thirsty. 
This is a reading from the Gospel of John. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Jesus had a body. Let me repeat that. Jesus had a body. Quite a few people have a difficult time accepting Jesus' humanity, maybe even people in this audience. Now, I believe, as the church teaches, and as I said, Jesus was fully human and fully divine, is fully human and fully divine. But some of us tend to focus almost exclusively on stories that seem to highlight his divine nature. The Son of God who went around healing the sick, raising people from the dead, stilling storms, all the kinds of miracles that people tend to associate with his divine power, even though we shouldn't separate divinity from humanity, because the human person is doing that too. In other words, some of us are tempted to believe that God was simply play-acting at being human, just kind of pretending. Some of us say, well, yeah, he might have suffered on the cross, but for the rest of his life, he was God. So he must have had it easier than the rest of us, right? Or we say, well, technically he was human, but he was God, so he really didn't have the same experiences that I do, right? Well, let me be clear again. Jesus was born, he lived and he died. The child called Yeshua, his name in Aramaic, entered the world as helpless as any newborn and just as dependent on his parents. Jesus needed to be nursed, held, fed, burped, and changed. Although I don't want to think of what diapers were like in first century Nazareth. It's probably made of wood, <laughs> made by Joseph. As a boy growing up in the tiny town of Nazareth, by the way, uh, there were about 150 people here, roughly, tonight. Nazareth was 200 to 400 people. So not too much bigger than this crowd. Jesus in that tiny little town would have skinned his knees on the rocky ground, bumped his head on doorways, and pricked his fingers on thorns. He would have gotten cuts and bruises like any child. Jesus had a body like ours. That means he ate like us, he drank like us, he slept like us. He went through puberty, right? Where do you think he got that beard? As a human being, he would have experienced the normal sexual longings and urges. We know he was unmarried and celibate. We know that for, through several ways. But he would have, as a human being, felt all the normal sexual attractions and desires. They are far from sinful, after all. He may have even fallen in love with the girl in Nazareth. Who knows? Jesus had a body. We know he got tired from time to time. In one gospel passage, he falls asleep on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. He pulled muscles, got headaches, felt sick to his stomach, came down with the flu, and maybe even sprained an ankle or two. In fact, a few years ago, a vicious stomach bug swept through our Jesuit community, a norovirus. You probably know what that is, right? Yes, everyone's like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> and let me tell you, when you live in a religious community... And one person gets sick, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> you can use all the Purell you want. And one night it hit me. It was the sickest I've ever been, and that includes two years in East Africa. In any event, and without going into unnecessary details, when I was hunched with my face over the toilet for the fifth time, I had a very strange thought. <laughs> Jesus did this. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm always thinking about Jesus. Yes, Jesus, as indelicate as it may sound to pious ears, threw up. Right? He was a human being. In fact, he may have had even more severe physical problems than you and I do, since health, sanitation, health and sanitation conditions were, far, were wretched in first century Nazareth, right? Sewage, for example, would have been simply tossed in the alleyways. Life expectancies were... 40 years. By the way, Jesus is old when he starts his ministry. We always think, I mean, I'm 55 now, I think, oh, 30, it's like a kid. That was considered old. Like all of us, Jesus sweated and sneezed and scratched. Everything proper to the human being, to the human body, he experienced except sin. These bodily experiences include hunger and here on the cross, thirst. Crucifixion, God bless you. Jesus sneezed, too. <laughs> As I said. Crucifixion was one of the most agonizing ways to die. The Romans devised it precisely because it was. 
A person was nailed to a cross, usually through the wrists, then set on a sort of small wooden seat fixed midway on the upright beam. Alternately, a small footrest was placed under the feet. So a lot of those paintings you see are accurate. That wasn't for comfort. Rather, it was to prolong the agony. Victims of crucifixion died either from loss of blood or, which I didn't realize this until I was researching this book on Jesus, another book on Jesus I did, asphyxiation, as the weight of the body compressed their rib cage and lungs. With this painful ability to support themselves, asphyxiation took longer, which is what the Romans wanted. In the blazing hot sun of Judea, Jesus would have thirsted. What does it mean that Jesus had a human body? What, is that, what does Jesus' having a human body mean for each of us? Let me suggest two things. First, something about our world, our community, our brothers and sisters. Second, something about us as individuals, and the two are, not surprisingly, connected. First, a word about our brothers and sisters. Think of the thirstiest you've ever been. I'll give you a second. Just think, think about it. What's the thirstiest you've ever been? Maybe you were running a race on a humid summer morning, right? Maybe you were walking on the street in New York, you know, one blistering hot afternoon when everybody else is away in the Hamptons, and it's just you, and you're hot as you know what, as hot as H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> or you were in the hospital one night, and the nurse forgot to bring you your ice chips. You ever have that happen? <sighs> Remember how good that first drink of water felt? You felt you couldn't go a moment longer. When that liquid finally coursed down your throat, it was so glorious, so satisfying, such a relief. For many people in the world, physical thirst is a daily experience. Clean water is not the lot of everyone. And by the way, I wrote this before Flint. All most of us have to do is turn on the tap to slake our thirst. But you might be surprised to learn that nearly 800 million people today lack access to clean, fresh water. And it is, interestingly, this is from a book, uh, uh, actually a conversation I had with a woman named Christiana Peppard, who is a, a Fordham theology professor, wrote a great book called Just Water. Great title. Women and children are most affected by these situations since the burden of procuring water usually falls to them in bodily form. Often, as I saw in East Africa, they must walk miles to acquire it and carry the heavy liquid back home. Let me tell you, you've seen these African women carrying what they've called jerry cans of water. It's unbelievable. It also affects them in terms of lost opportunity for education and earning a living. Finally, which I did know, many women are physically or sexually assaulted while out getting water. Since we know that the body of Christ is all of us, all of our brothers and sisters, you can say that Jesus' body is going thirsty right now and is suffering. So it's a good thing to think about during Lent which began yesterday. If you are sad about Jesus' body having thirsted on the cross 2,000 years ago and even shed a tear, you know, we can be moved by that. Then shed a tear for the members of his body who are thirsting right now. Why not shed a tear for those who suffer bodily today through thirst or hunger or nakedness, right? We see this right outside in the street. Or imprisonment or torture or famine or assault or abuse shed a tear, and then try to do something about it. Why not let that sorrow spur you to action? After all, again, a good thing to, to think about during Lent, this is one way that God moves us to act. God moves us through these feelings of compassion. The second point about Jesus having a body has to do with us as individuals, and it is this. Jesus understands what you are going through physically. It's a very important point. Everyone here in this audience has some physical burden that represents a cross in their lives. Perhaps it's something very small right now, like a cold or a scratchy throat. Maybe it's something bigger, like a chronic illness, right, that saps your energy. I bet a lot of people out there are sitting there with back problems, right? Maybe it's something even bigger than that, like struggling with a life-threatening illness. Particularly when the cross is a big one, God can feel far away and we wonder, does God even care about me? But remember this, God had a body. In fact, I like to say this, <laughs> God has a body because Christ is risen, right? 
really and truly, the risen Christ carries within himself the experiences of his humanity, and that includes suffering. Remember that in one of the first appearances after the resurrection, he shows the disciples his wounds, remember? That important theological insight often goes overlooked. I really find this, I don't know, very moving, I would say. That's kind of a paltry word to use. The risen Christ is the same person as the Jesus of Nazareth who walked the earth. The resurrection does not mean that a new person was kind of created, right? No, it's the same person. And he bears the marks of his physical suffering on his resurrected body. As Jesus says to the Apostle Thomas after the resurrection, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Stanley Marrow, a Jesuit and a New Testament scholar who died a few years ago and who was my professor for a course in the Gospel of John, summarizes this idea beautifully in his commentary on the Gospel of John. I'll read you a somewhat long paragraph. I just think this is beautiful. It's very, like, forceful, too. The risen Lord had to be recognizably and identifiably Jesus of Nazareth, the man whom the disciples knew and followed, whom they saw and heard, with whom they ate, and because of whom they now cowered behind closed doors. For him to have risen as any other than the Jesus of Nazareth they knew would void the resurrection of all meaning. Isn't that great? The one they had confessed as their risen Lord is the same Jesus of Nazareth they knew and followed. This is so beautiful. Showing them his hands and his side, which bore the marks of the crucifixion and the pierced by the lance, was not a theatrical gesture, but the necessary credentials of the identity of the risen Lord who stood before them with the crucified Jesus of Nazareth, whom they knew, end quote. Isn't that beautiful? His credentials. Therefore, the risen Lord, the risen Christ, remembers his suffering. So when you pray, you are praying not simply to someone who understands you because he is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-compassionate. You are praying to someone who understands you because he went through what you're going through. And God wants you to pray to him. God desires a relationship with you. So much so that God came down to earth and suffered physically for you. That's one reason God comes to us, to help us to be in relationship. God wants that so much. God, you could say, thirsts for it. Thank you very much. So um, now we have time for questions. I think they, they passed out little cars and stuff. So I guess someone, maybe you can pass them up somehow. Is someone going to collect them? Some? Oh, we, we are. are. Okay, we sorry. are. We're going to do that. We're going to collect you. some questions. Thank and you. While we do that, um, I just want to take a minute while the ushers uh, gather the questions for Father Martin. Um, if uh, you've... Um, already purchased a copy of Father Martin's book, at the end of the question and answer, there'll be a line formed over here. And if you have not, you'll be able to do so by going out the, the doors uh, behind you and getting it at the concession stand. But um, while we collect the, collection, uh, the, the questions, let me just <laughs> You're say... You're very Catholic, uh, collecting the collection. Right? <laughs> but, uh, we will pass the hat, too. <laughs> but thank you, Father. Hey, sure. that, was, that was extraordinary. There's a, there's a number of things uh, up and coming at the Sheen Center that I, I think I should just take a quick second to mention while we gather the questions. Um, if you like books, uh, anybody in the audience who doesn't know who Jorge Bogalio, Bogalio is? <laughs> I hope you do. There's somebody back there you don't know? Oh, well, he got a gig a couple of years ago. He's now in Italy. He's a Jesuit. Um, Former provincial, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, truly, um, Pope Francis's new book, um, 
the name of God is Mercy, is our next subject. It's here next Thursday night. Um, a great panel on this book. I highly recommend this. In the Year of Mercy, this is a jewel of a book written by the Pope. Um, and next uh, Thursday, the 18th of February, uh, it's only $10. Um, there's a great panel of people who will be speaking about that. If you have the questions, we can bring them up for Father. That would be great. Thank you. Um, also, if you're a Broadway fan, great. Thanks so much. <laughs> If you're a Broadway fan, on February the 28th, Kate Baldwin will be here um, with a great cast of people. More book stuff. Uh, Cardinal Dolan will be here on May the 3rd, um, speaking about a terrific book um, called uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral, uh, The Legacy of America's Parish Church, with an all-star cast of uh, panelists. Um, and then also for those who are Irish and Italians uh, among us, uh, Peter Quinn and Paul Moses, oh great, and Robert Orsi will be here um, uh, on April the 14th. Um, and um, this being a center for thought and culture, that piano is there for a reason, because besides uh, thought stuff, we also do an awful lot of programming in theater and music and dance. And I just would uh, recommend for anybody who's watching on the live stream, um, just check out our website and for you as well. Um, it's literally just sheencenter.org. Uh, and speaking of collections, Father, <laughs> we will be taking one up. And if anyone wants to donate to the Sheen Center, it is sheencenter.org on the live stream. But for you here tonight, we rely on, on our patrons for a free event like this. So if you are interested in making a donation, there will be a little basket at the back. If you wish to, honestly, no problem if you can't. Um, but with all that, I'd like to turn it back to Father Martin. And he can take these questions. and. We'll, uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, these are great. I think I might be able to answer them all. I won't ask them at length, but um, <laughs> some of them are like lifetime questions. These are great. Um, if Jesus was recognizable, why did his disciples not recognize him? <laughs> On the road to Emmaus. Good question. Um, you know, the glorified body, which is the way we look at the, um, the resurrected Christ, that's what theologians call it, um, was something that no one had ever really experienced before, obviously, or since, right? And so uh, it's very hard for the, disciple, the uh, gospel writers to describe it. He's, he's bodily, but he's not bodily, right? I mean, it's, uh, he touched me, but, they, but he seems to kind of pass through walls. They recognize him. They don't recognize him. Uh, I think part of it was that, um, as I understand it, not having seen the glorified body, um, you know, they were encountering something that was very different. And I think they, they had a hard time just sort of um, accepting it and sort of understanding what they were experiencing. So I think that's part of the idea behind not recognizing him. Uh, in, for example, the, um, the separate Emmaus, you know, those kinds of things. So that's, that's my sense. And also the gospel writers are having a hard time explaining exactly what the disciples were experiencing. Do you want to give me those? Thanks. Now I may not be asked to go back to all of them. Um, let's see. I'll pick some. Another one. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I will not be able to answer all these questions. Oh, man, that's a hard one. <laughs> the mystery of suffering. I always get that one. Um, why do you frequently write about conflicts within Jesuit communities? I don't know. I think one of my Jesuit community members is here. Uh, you know, I write, about, I write about sort of things from my own life, basically, and I try to, um, you know, be honest about what I go through. Uh, and, you know, that includes conflict sometimes. Hey, I mean, I, I can't write about conflict with my wife or my children because... Because um, they don't like me to write about them. Um, <laughs> they're very shy. Both of my wives are very shy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, and I, so I, I think it's important to write about um, human struggle and my own human struggle. I like books that are, are honest, the author is honest. So, sometimes to make a point, I will say, in my Jesuit community. Now, you, I will always disguise things, or I'll say, a friend. Um, because it's important for people to know that we don't always have perfect lives and we, we struggle sometimes. Um, why were these words important to include in their respective gospel narratives? Great question. And actually, I was just thinking about that the other day. Uh, you know, different gospels stress different things. So Mark's gospel stresses his humanity, right? Very much so. And um, let's see. So I'll just take a, a few examples. Don't worry. These questions will not go on for too long. You know, so my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is very human, right? John's gospel, 
would never say that because, you know, Jesus is sort of, it's more the divine Jesus. Um, and it is finished. I mean, John's gospel, this is a great completion of the work. You know, so they're stressing different things. Uh, Luke, truly I tell, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Those are very kind of Lucan themes, aren't they? Forgiveness, gentleness, compassion. So they stress certain things, and I like to say that would have been important to their communities. So I think that's, that's maybe a good answer to that question. When Jesus walked the earth as a human being, did he have some sense of, boy, these are like, these are like masters of divinity comprehensive exam questions. <laughs> did he have a sense of his divinity or did he only understand who he was after the resurrection? How long do you have? <laughs> so in my book, Jesus a Pilgrimage, which makes the perfect gift for your friends and family, <laughs> and is now on paperback. There's a number of ways of looking at this, which I find, that's a great question. I find this endlessly fascinating. It's, it's the question of his self-consciousness, his self-identity, right? Um, how did he understand himself? Elizabeth Johnson, who's a professor of theology at Fordham, says that we don't know what Jesus thought you know, about his divinity, but we certainly know that he didn't look in the mirror every morning and say, I am the second person of the Trinity, you know? <laughs> None the, so, so what do we know? Now, some, some scholars would disagree with that. Some scholars think that he knew from the moment of his conception, which is possible. I would think that if he has a human consciousness, one tends to grow in one's understanding of one's vocation, right? And my sense is that he grew in his, identi his, his understanding of his identity. And you can make a case for that. You know, at the wedding feast of Cana, which is his first miracle, they, his mother says they have run out of wine. And he says, you know, woman, what concern is that of yours? What concern of that? What can, why does that concern you and me? You know, there's this sort of like pushback. And Mary says, do whatever he tells you. So there's a kind of reluctance almost. He performs the miracle, right? And that at that point, he must have had this inclination of who he was. Now, at the baptism, he has the experience, this revelation of himself as God's beloved son. What does that mean, right? He might have thought, I'm the Messiah, you know, but, and that, in that moment, Messiah did not incorporate the idea of divinity. So I think he grows in that. Because, you know, for, later on, when people suggest miracles, you know, you can heal me if you choose it. I do choose it. He's confident, you know. And then Elizabeth Johnson says in a wonderful phrase that perhaps, that the, perhaps even Jesus didn't know what was going to happen on the cross on Good Friday. It's very moving. And perhaps on Easter he was surprised when his, it's a beautiful phrase, Elizabeth Johnson, when his ultimate identity burst upon him in full clarity. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's the most beautiful thing she's ever written. So I, I would suggest that he grew in his identity of, of who he was, as we do. I have not read your whole book yet. What? <laughs> However, I should probably read these before I... If it is on the traditional Western words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I believe the Eastern theologians believe the best translation is my God, for this purpose I was spared. It's interesting. This translation fulfills the Old and the New Testament. Why persist with a sentence out of context with the rest? Well, you know, I'm, I'm taking this from the New Revised Standard Version. So these are going back to the original Greek, basically. So they may have a different uh, translation, but that, that really is very close to as I translate the Greek. So... Father James, if you could share one of Jesus' last words to the following, which one would it be and why? A, an atheist. B, someone on the fence about, about their faith. Oh, an atheist? I think, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Because it shows his struggle, his spiritual struggles. And they, those atheists, I think, and agnostics are struggling. Uh, someone on the fence about their faith? Mm. I think I thirst. I really like those two. It shows he understands you. He gets you. You're on the fence, he gets that. He's human. Oh, another easy question. Who is God to you? <laughs> uh, I mean, you're going to laugh. Jesus. That's who, I, that's who I have a relationship with. So when I think of God, I think of Jesus. That's how I relate to God. That doesn't mean I don't believe in the Father, Trinity, but... And they're not, when I got to heaven, they're going to be like this. You didn't like us as much. <laughs> but then Jesus will say, you can come in. <laughs> so yeah, Jesus. How do you find calm and contemplation in the endless bustle of a city like New York? 
Um, well, you know, my Jesuit community is actually pretty quiet, which is nice. My room is pretty quiet, so I retreat. Just like, you know, Jesus had to withdraw from the disciples. You know that great that withdraw? He's always withdrawing, especially in Luke. He needed time away. We all need time away. Sometimes you just have to say, no, you have to cut, shut the phone off. I know that's possible. Um, and you do have to withdraw a bit. That doesn't mean you can't find God in the day-to-day, but I think there does need time for one-on-one quiet time with God. Okay. Recovery from failure or sin is also a fundamental part of being human. Failure. Oh, recovery from failure or sin. Okay. How do you respond to those who wonder how Jesus experienced full humanity without experiencing sin? Well, it's important to remember that um, he, he was tempted, and not just at the not just, you know, in his 40 days in the desert or in the garden. I mean, he's tempted. He's a human being. He's tempted by all sorts of things, probably pride and all sorts of things. But he had, you know, I can't climb into Jesus' mind. But he's also fully divine. And so he has the ability to move away from that and to always choose the good. Um, so we tend to forget he was tempted. Okay, I answered that. If the risen Jesus was the same as Jesus of Nazareth, I do believe that. But Mary Magdalene and Emmaus, the disciples, did not know him. Okay, I think I answered that. You mentioned sexual desires. Does that not imply that he had concupiscence or disordered affections like fallen man? No, I don't think so. I mean, he had, I mean, if he's a human being, he has human desires. He gets, these are bodily desires. There's nothing sinful about those. So that's that's how I look at it. Um, how do we know, by the way, that he's celibate? That's kind of an interesting question. Um, let me just make sure. I don't want to go over it too long. Remember, I said it's only four hours. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, you know, the Da Vinci Code and all that, uh, he didn't have to be celibate, but he chose to be celibate, it seems, out of a sense of religious conviction, right? Like a sort of a sign of his wholehearted commitment. Now, that does not mean that married people cannot show their wholehearted commitment to God, but this is Jesus' way of doing it. He may have also known sort of foreseen what was going to happen in the sense that he knew what happened to the Jewish prophets, and so he didn't want to involve a wife, right? Sort of subject her to that. But, you know, were he married and were Mary Magdalene his... Well, first of all, there's no mention of a wife in the Gospels. That's important. There's a mention of every other family member. Remember when Mary and his family, his brothers and sisters, go to collect him? Remember? They go, they go from Nazareth to Capernaum, which is kind of a big deal, to restrain him. We tend to overlook that. Mary and his family go 40 miles to restrain him, for they thought he was out of his mind. Yeah, that's, that's pretty. Well, where is, where is the wife, basically, right? If Mary Magdalene were his wife, she would be not Mary Magdalene. She would be Mary, the wife of Jesus. So, so he's, he's celibate. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's pretty clear. What's a good way to introduce the wounded Christ to someone who hasn't met him? That's beautiful. I think through the, through the passion. And my book, Seven Last Words. <laughs> Please explain how it is possible to have a friendship with Jesus. Well, I think that uh, part of it is, first of all, trusting that God wants... Jesus desires a relationship with you. If you have a desire for that, that's Jesus' call. That's how God works. So to, to trust, the first thing is to trust that that desire for relationship with Jesus is coming from Jesus. That which you seek is seeking you already. So that should give you some comfort. Second, I think learning about him, reading the Gospels, right? Why would you not want to learn about your friend? Right? Third, encountering him in prayer in whatever way you do. Fourth, finding him in people, and fifth, encountering him in the sacraments. So, why do you frequently write about conflicts within Jesuit communities? No, I'm not that frequently. All right. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. I think we're. I think we got them all. One more. One more long one. Okay. Sometimes, when innocent or good people become very sick, like children, people say that those suffering don't deserve it. They may even say God doesn't do this or proves God doesn't exist. What would you say to that? So, in other words, explain the mystery of suffering. Well, um, here's the thing. There is no adequate explanation for that. That is a mystery. Suffering is a mystery. And I don't mean to just throw up my hands, but 
Anyone who tells you, now I'm going to tell you why innocent children suffer. One of the judgments of my community just told me that he's worried about, without bringing confidence, he's worried about his six-year-old nephew's tumor on his leg, right? Right, so pray for him. Um, if someone tells you, now I'm going to tell you why that happens or why you know, accidents happen or natural disasters happen, don't listen to them. There, I mean, there, there's no answer for that. Theologians and saints and people over the ages have been struggling with that question. So there is no satisfactory answer for that. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't perspectives on it. And the two perspectives that help me the most are, uh, number one, uh, Jesus understands your suffering. As I said, this is why these seven last words are so important to me. That Jesus is with you in that suffering. Right? As, as your friend and as your savior and as someone who understands it. You're never alone. And two, suffering is never the last word. So this book, you know, is not the end of the story. Right? There's the, always the resurrection. So there always is this hope of of new life, of new possibility, right? So that, that, that needs to be understood. Good Friday is meaningless without Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, though, is meaningless without Good Friday, right? Uh, and so those are two perspectives I think are very important. But the other thing is you cannot, you cannot sort of impose that on people. I think people need to discover that themselves. You know, if a, I mean, God forbid, if someone comes to me and says my child is sick, I'm not going to say, oh, number one, you know, I mean, you know, you invite them to kind of experience that for themselves. Um, and and here, I think here's something that's very important that I've been thinking about a lot for the last few years. Um, I don't need to believe in a God. I, I don't need to believe in a God that I understand. Does that make sense? I think there's a certain desire in us, you know, naturally, to want to understand God and box God in and say, "This is it. This is the meaning." You know, for example, you sometimes hear, um, you know, God gives us suffering to whatever to teach us. Now, I think that you can learn a lot from suffering, right? I've had different kinds of suffering in my life, and I've learned from it, but I don't think God gave me that suffering, so, you know, like, hit me over the head with it. You know, it's like Mother Teresa, Saint Mother Teresa, Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Or someone called me, someone said to me, some reporter said to me, um, what do you think, do you think she'll be Saint Blessed Mother Teresa? I said, no, that's a little much. Um, <laughs> She is supposed to have said to someone um, that suffering, she said to this dying guy, suffering is Jesus' kiss. And she reported this herself. And the guy said back to her, tell him to stop kissing me. <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 you we, we believe in a God who really is mystery, right? And also it's very important to, to understand that um, after Jesus left Galilee and Judea, they were still sick people. Do you ever think about that? I mean, he did not heal everyone, right? Which is very mysterious and very interesting. I, I read a, a commentary that said recently that we tend to get overwhelmed by suffering, but when you think about it, Jesus helped the people in front of him, right? He doesn't go to the top of the mountain and say, I now, which is, I, you know, I really could imagine this, I now heal all of Galilee. He doesn't. It's the woman with the hemorrhage or the Roman centurion who asked for healing of the servant. It's just very interesting. Mysterious, isn't it? Isn't that mysterious? It's very strange. Um, that will remain a mystery until we all meet Jesus. Listen, thank you very much for your time. and uh, Keep me in your prayers, and I'll see you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.